Welcome again, everyone, to yet another thematic presentation on text, speaking volume, ceramics, and language. Again, this is an aspect of ceramics that's often neglected, both in its history and in the contemporary contribution that it makes. It's interesting to consider that in Mesopotamia, ceramics itself, the material, the technology, were at the center of the origin of mathematics, the origin of the written script. And those of you interested in this historical aspect may want to read the text chapter in the historical material available on the, the Art of the Future website. But I just want to show you here, you know, that those objects being clay objects, whether they were fired or not, when the library burned eventually, they became permanent, and we get a lot of information from those uh, texts from the very ancient past because they were printed on ceramics. So there are contemporary makers who take advantage of this process of clay becoming permanent once fired and creating new experiences. And Anna Mayer makes work with texts on them that she then fires in nature. She puts them on the ground in various natural sites that she then fires and wait for a wildfire to come through. And once the wildfire has had an impact on her work, she retrieves it and uses it in exhibition displays. Even the earliest example of printing we have, the Phaistos disc from Crete from 2000 BCE, which is stamp text on discs. Um, this is on ceramic. So the earliest form of printing is a ceramic object. And then I have, just to give you a brief historical introduction to how ceramic, text, language, history, and civilization come together those wonderful Gallo-Roman pottery accounts describing the content of kilns and thus pottery practice. And again, there is more information in the historical reading that some of you may want to access and read. The earliest Sign. work of art we have in the history of art is this vessel form from 590 BCE by Sophilos. And you have a detail of his signature on the right. He was the first person to sign his own name on a work of art, and this happened on a ceramic object that was preserved to us. Now I have a large selection of contemporary examples, as I always do. I'm starting with the work of Grayson Perry, who, at the very beginning of his career as a potter and an artist, used references to his own life, here references to being a transvestite, and introducing all kinds of information at the level of text in his ceramics. And throughout his career, he has made wonderful work with the use of text, you know, the use of um, bubbles with conversations and exchange between people or word defining, you know, what you're looking at and references to all kinds of things. There is quite a variety of things that he makes using language in so many different ways. And I really like those little plaque by Edouard Jasmet from Montreal. He was an outsider artist working completely outside the art world. But at some point, his work became quite popular in both Toronto and New York. He developed a market there. And for that reason, started to make work based on language and with the translation of all the quite elaborate text in French and in English as well, and it, at some point it sort of overwhelmed almost the whole surface of his rather narrative and uh, illustrative work. And two examples here by Robert Arneson, just his name printed on a brick, or a typewriter with fingers. And again, another form of ref references to language and storytelling and narrative context. And the wonderful work of Richard Millet, The Treachery of Images after René Magritte, Ceci n'est pas une pipe. And I have discussed this work before, and there is more on it in the writing assigned for this specific presentation on text. And now I have some example of my own work, 
which follows into the footstep of Magritte again, and uh, with this is not a cup or ceci n'est pas une taillère, but obviously there is a cup there, there is a teapot there, but there's also the representation of a teapot and the representation of the cup at the level of its surface where it becomes two-dimensional and it's a, a play on, a, you know, like a visual play on the nature of images versus object, which is something I discuss repeatedly in all the readings for this seminar. And then again, a few more work by myself, those very tiny salt and pepper shaker sets, um, various 20th century disasters, including the Shoah on the right, and a souvenir of Tiananmen Square, front and back. So it says clearly souvenir of Tiananmen with the date, and at the back it's freedom, democracy, human rights. And of course, when 9-11 happened, it was too good of an opportunity to pass to make a salt and pepper shaker set with that very important event as well. And then while in China, I made a series of those binary bowls. And on each one of them, there is always two bowls in a pair. And on the interior and exterior of those objects, there is a double question. What is inside? What is outside? Those kinds of things to make you aware again of what is ceramic and how it behaves and how it is experience. Now I'm moving on to the work of many other makers. Stephen Friedman, whose work I have shown you before as well, introduces a lot of language in his work, poetry, sometimes collaboratively with various people. Another example here of his work. So it's, it's quite interesting, again, what happens when language finds itself in the context of pottery form, of ceramics, the resiliency of the material, the archival nature that it has, the way it passes information over time. And many contemporary makers are exploring this potential, sometimes in ways that creates confusion or ambiguity, and at other times more clarity. But um, the idea of uh, ambiguity is, is quite often present in those work. And um, it's, it's interesting to consider all the various ways in which ceramics and language can come together. Sometimes people use languages that are specific to a culture. At times, it can even be an invented language, like Chitojin on the right from Japan, where this ref references text and makes you think of writing and language and script and, and narration of some sort, but it cannot be read. It is an invented form of script. And potters like Julia Galloway or Tom Splett sometimes introducing just fragments of information about domesticity, daily activities, relationships in their life, you know, things that are happening, just to share with you an aspect of their humanity that is perfect for the domestic nature of those objects that you may have in your home and use yourself. And I find those four cups quite interesting with the bowl by Luciri, a, a large Peter Volkos, a Robert Turner piece, and a uh, Anne Scooper on the right. And using digital technology and photographs, the artist transferred images of those very famous objects on the side of a cup. And on the other side, just wrote the, the name of the various artists. So it's interesting that it is ceramics on ceramics and introduces language as well. And there are quite a lot of examples of that all over the world. Ruan Hoffman is from South Africa, I believe. And again, it's just a way to introduce, um, you know, an element of recognizability. Everybody can read the and everybody can assess reading in different way. Images have more ambiguity and can be interpreted quite differently from language. And I find, you know, artists speaking about various conditions or situations or political, social um, contexts in their life where they are and making references to newspaper, to stories, to, to what's happening. And Anne Krauss and Kevin Snipe 
are, are great masters of this combination of um, ceramics and language form and surface 2D and 3D words and image and object that I find quite exciting within very specific and quite a firm personal sensibilities. Another example here of a work by Anne Krauss and a detail of the kind of information that she has on her work which has again to the ambiguity, to the mystery, to the secretive nature of the whole object in, in its combination of fiction and decoration and function and image and object. And of course the great work of Matt Nolan as well whose work I have presented to you before. It's um, interesting again how, how those possibilities that are quite specific of cer to ceramic itself in, in ways it conflate all of those contrasting and sometimes oppositional aspect of experience into one object. And people making references to their cultural past or stories from their life, speaking of identity politics, um, personal narratives. You may want to stop this image and read, if you read Cyrillic on the left, it's in Russian, or This Life of Fear by Gary Lebovitz, who is a New York artist. And um, I have quite a lot of exciting examples, you know, where the text references what happens to the objects themselves, how they are coming apart and meant to be experienced and reorganized and so on. And uh, it's, it's quite potent. And Jerry Williams, working in the 1960s, was one of the first contemporary makers using photo silk screen information and text to speak on contemporary society in the United States. And I have shown you before the work of Katie King in the context of the narrative aesthetics and, and others possibly, but this is from her vanity bedroom, vanity, vanity. And again, the way it introduces language to just describe things, um, but also, you know, speaks of various states. I quite like the work of Jane Irish. This is two examples of her work here where she makes all kinds of references to famous artists, events in the art world. And it is quite interesting the way she combines re historical references. The forms are historical shapes. The decoration is also referential of, of various decorative aspects in the history of ceramics. And then personalizes it with all kinds of little stories written on the side that makes references to all kinds of complex possibilities. Sin Ying Ho, whose work we've seen as well, introducing um, texts and personal and um, pop references in her work, which otherwise has other kind of um, conflations. You see here an example of that with references to McDonald, to Coca-Cola, to all kinds of things. You know, the way ceramics is so very deeply a cultural material that speaks of history, that speaks of time, that speaks of current states of things in the world right now, but will pass it on through its archival nature, are all at the center of the investigation that many of those artists are making. And I believe this is what Judy Chatron does with her wonderful pail of lard or her native spirituality in a spray bomb, 100% guaranteed. And, um, you know, references to racism, to um, colonialism, an indigenous aspect of contemporary society. A very potent bowl about downtown east side um, slum hotels and the meatless soup can with references to different food that could have been used by First Nation societies. The work of Stephen Bird comes up quite regularly as well. And again, you know, what does he mean here by the addition of the word dual in that piece? You know, there is, uh, there is quite a lot of ambiguity to language as well and double meaning and uh, word plays that are possible to introduce that add to 
your understanding and interpretation of those pieces. I have shown you the work of Kumio Mishima. And again, example on, on how those simulation aesthetic objects can introduce you know, text and language at the level of adding to the recognizability of what you are looking at. And Matura, again, with those bags, with stories of, of displacement, of moving, of changing spaces, of start, starting life in a new place. And ceramic, with its deep connections to domestic daily activities, is the perfect medium to convey those kinds of narrative. And even an artist like Jim Dine, the very celebrated pop artist who's known mostly as a painter and a sculptor, but I've shown you some of his uh, descriptive flower drawing on pots before and here introducing language in a very powerful way, somewhat confrontational and aggressive on those very large ceramic form that he has built. While Adrian Sack plays in a more, much more humoristic way with the relationship between three letters that could be dog or could be God if you move them into another position. And then on the right, an ampersand teapot that celebrates the Baroque nature of ceramic and the Baroque nature of script and text as well. And another example of Adrian Sachs' work that spells Elvis but if you jumble the set a bit, it's lives, very same five letters. So Elvis lives. Stephanie D. Arman, again, using script to create sculptural form with decorative surfaces that address all of those issues with rather a complex solution. And I just find it quite interesting that there has been a resurgence again in the world of contemporary ceramic for the use of language and text in all kinds of amazing ways. It creates the possibility for new forms to be made, new relationship, new ways of containment and containers. Words are also containers. They're containers of meaning, containers of references, and so on. And so they're quite perfect to be conflated with ceramic and vessels and so on. This is Joel Sepp, how to get the attention of a prospective lover by breaking a pot on its head. Gordy Shepherd, another one of my students from year back with travel memories. It's just a way to introduce that a wonderful relationship that with daily life and what, what it means to be human at, this, at, this, at any time by the use of language, which, which is a much more universal form of communication and like exchange and meaning sharing than forms, object, or even images are. And that's what Richard Millet makes you aware of here. He has used the word instead of the image. He has removed the image, the narrative scene, and replaced it just with the word where the image and the narrative scene would be on those vessels form. And he has done so here again by somewhat deconstructing a word like fuck or homo. And those objects are from the series Four Letter Words, which also combine approaches to decoration and the excess that's so often present in ceramic context historically and today as well. Or making an object that's itself an hybrid of two forms that are not meant to be together and incorporating a small fragment of text that gives you the information necessary to understand that you're looking at the text, but not enough information to make any sense of it. So the rebus on the right are of, the, of that nature as well. They are actually decipherable. You can make some sense of what is being written there. But in the end, what you get is a sentence that doesn't make any sense. So there is sort of a contradiction as work. And that's quite potent as well. And Gisela Mantea putting all kinds of uh, narrative within the context of excessive, over-the-top decoration. Bako Oahama taking coils of clay and shaping them in words that then become sentences, that then become long texts that can be read or can be quite literal, but that's also can just become jumbles of things and, and the confusion that language can introduce 
in human interaction. So again, just what happens when ceramic, clay, the process of making, the way things are presented, the experience that they create for you when text is added to the mix are part of the kind of work I'm showing you here. And Marek Cecula in his, the four great religion group of objects here, this is Judaism with lamentation and we know how important language and literature and the written word is to the Jewish tradition. This is here a detail of this work. I believe it's probably a biblical quote in Hebrew. And he has done so as well for Islam by trailing Arabic script, probably coming from the Quran, and suspending in it in the air with the projection of the shadow on the wall. Suzanne Wolf, working from a feminist perspective and with found objects that she then transformed with the addition of printed script that is fused on those objects and from object to object, relationships are created and connections can be made between words and sentences and it becomes sort of a critical analysis of the relationship between men and women in the world in which we live. Yoko Ono has done quite a bit of ceramics. I've shown you some of her performative and uh, installation pieces before. This is work that she does more or less in a commercial context to sell. You can go on the internet and buy those things. And you can modify existing objects by water jet cutting aspects of them to change again uh, a simple cup or a simple plate into an object that engages with the complexity of uh, experiences in new ways. I quite like those history plates, again, that you can get on the internet and purchase on various sites. One on ancient Rome with the history of ancient Rome all around and one on Egypt. There are quite a few over various cultures and civilization. And it's quite interesting to see what happens. You know, again, when you put text on a plate, and how it changes the plate, it changes the text, the text is changed by the plate in its context on such a familiar object, and the plate itself is changed as well by having such a text on it. And people are investigating again issues of racism, of sexuality, of sexism, uh, all kinds of you know political aspects, and, and again, a plate is a very interesting context for those kinds of investigation to take place. And I'm just showing you here a few examples of those types of work made by various artists all over the world. And just as a relief from this type of rather heavy material, those crossword puzzle plates and crossword puzzle cups that you can buy on the New York Times site. Or those coffee cup again, with funny, humorous, sort of in-your-face sayings and um, small bits of um, knowledge and wisdom, maybe, possibly. Or a cup with various colors inserted in size, so you can name the color of your coffee depending on of its color-coded quality. Or those salt and pepper sh shakers that become cocaine and heroin instead, and speak of other kinds of addictions. Yoshitomo Nara has introduced language often in the work made, and this is just an example of that. Again, if you want to buy that ash tree, it's 120 sterling pounds on the internet. And you may be too young to die. I very much like those cups by A.D. Bremen with the band of gold. And what happens is when you use those cups over a certain period of time, the gold will wear away, it will disappear slowly, and there is a secret message underneath the band of gold that will be revealed over time through use. And designers of all kinds are also introducing for example, the relationship between design and sign by somewhat splitting the word in two are created by vases for 
blind people so that by handling the wear, because ceramics is a very tactile material, very physical, meant to be touched and handled and experienced in a very sensual way. And those makers are introducing braille for blind people within the context of those kind of experience available within ceramic tiles. Aaron Nelson with his QR code of plates. Again, you take a picture of this QR code and it will take you to a website where more information is available about his work. I now have a sections on books and volumes that we have talked about boots and books and boxes before because books are also in a very interesting relationship with ceramics and with language, obviously, and those are alcohol bottles imitating books. You fill them with alcohol, you put them in your, on your shelf, and nobody knows you have alcohol around. They date from the 19th century and were made in America and in Canada. I quite like those Bibles by Takako Araki made with very thin slabs of clay or Nina June, who is projecting the text over a ceramic object in the shape of a book. Now, if you find a printed book or a printed magazine with a very high kaolin paper content, you can simply fire it, and the clay present in the paper will fuse and fix itself and create the kind of experience you see here. So again, a quite a broad selection of things just to introduce you various makers, various possibilities to make references to books within the context of ceramics and secret informations and diaries and inventive stories like in the case of the scripture of Imiko by Ryo Sakumiwa from Japan. Those are very, very big, big books. They're basically life-size, they're large sculptural objects that appear to be breaking and so on. And it's all an invented mythology about his own connection to it, the historical nature of his family in Japan. And it just goes on and on. It's quite interesting, again, to consider that a book is also a container. It's also an object. It's also meant to be handled and used the way most ceramic objects are. So that creates a very in intimate and deep relationship between the familiarity of ceramic and the familiarity of books and how the two can come together in very exciting ways. And um, they also make references to culture, to history, to religion, to mythologies. Uh, specific colors can be meaningful of specific things. The shape and size of books varies from culture to culture and books can be cast they can be they are themselves multiples they exist in many exemplary it's very rare for a book to be a, in a single example and again by using slip casting and mold making people can make multiples of books to create all kinds of new objects and new experiences and new references as well we all know what books are what they look like what they're about and they introduced very interesting metaphors that are used by all those people to make very interesting work of great interest and making references to glaze technology, secret glazes, um, you know, the whole sort of um, cultish nature of the ceramic world at times and books that you cannot open, you know, so there is an element of frustration of, you know, you have to use your own imagination to decide what's inside and what would happen if you were to open such an object, which is now um, preventing you from doing so because of its transfer in clay. And Victor Sikansky, whose work we've seen in a variety of contexts before, because those aesthetics and those themes are not specific to a single work I am presenting to you, come from a variety of aesthetics like this is the simulation aesthetic as well and a variety of theme the apple could reference food for example and um, i'm just presenting you a selection of artists you may want to research further if you're curious find out more about them find out why they do books books that references library 
um, books that re references different cultures, different possibilities, book made with un un weird materials again, or, or books that could become sculptural presentation in libraries connecting the interior and the exterior of a room through a window. And this is the smallest book ever printed. It's extremely, extremely small. You could put it on the head of a pin and lose it. And it's made with silicon atoms. And it tells a story, Tiny Ted from Tiny Town. And it's the tiniest book ever made. And it is because of its silicon nature. It's a ceramic object. And you can see here how somebody like Edmund de Waal will make subtle references through Mesopotamian dictionaries and historical references. The work is just a shelving unit with a variety of pots assembled on those shelves, but it makes references at the level of organization and design through the printed page or newspaper format. I have shown you the wonderful coffee shop in New York before I'm showing it again in relation to books, libraries, language, ceramic, and text. And you find example of that in all kinds of contexts. Traveling the world, you will find all kinds of examples of people using ceramic in interesting ways. And here in relations to book for a library in Amsterdam, again, because it is now translated into ceramics, it can be place into the context of architecture. It can be rained on. It won't be modified by sunlight. It will last forever. While books are quite fragile things, they're, they're very brittle. They don't last very long. They degrade very rapidly. And it's quite interesting to contest those properties of paper and books to uh, translate it into ceramics and present another possibility for their permanency. And this is Kate and Will Wedding Memorabilia from 2011 when the prince and princess married. You can go on the internet and buy those plates. We're getting close to the end here. I've shown you those portion plates again. They are diet shaming plates. And again, they introduce within the context of food, of ceramics, and of domestic aspects, the use of uh, language in a very specific way. And this is Barack Obama's birth certificate printed on a plate so that you can have proof that he was actually born in the United States, contrary to what the present president thinks. And again, it's an interesting way of, um, you know, celebrating someone and his life and his birth, but also give permanency uh, to something that has been challenged as non-existent within the political system. All over London in England, there are those blue discs inserted in on buildings um, to celebrate various occupants of those buildings, like Jimi Hendrix or John Lennon. There are hundreds of them all over the city of London. Just to remind you again that ceramic is the memory of humankind. And the very last image for today, those two small souvenirs of Canada that incorporate, again, the wonderful quality of ceramic material, ceramic objects, ceramic experience, with the addition of a few words to contextualize it specifically in time and place. So see you next week. Thank you.